since 1938. Matson and the Adahi Tunnel Program. Cars Plus, home of Guam's first and only lifetime limited powertrain warranty. McDonald's of Guam, I'm loving it, and King's Restaurants. Always open, always local, and serving up favorites for over 40 years. Now on Primetime this afternoon, the governor held a press conference presenting numbers and stats and the latest on containing COVID. Plus, cases of fraud hold up the latest batch of pandemic unemployment assistance payments. Peter Santos has that report. And known as the Quarantine Queen, Tyler Matanani shares how one mother and daughter have been stuck at the government isolation facility for 30 days. and good evening, everyone. Guam is in the middle of two different waves of COVID-19, and our healthcare system is at risk. That was the sobering assessment during a press conference today at Adloop called to update the community on the latest on containing the spread. Physicians Advisory Group member Dr. Felix Cabrero went over the latest numbers, which show record hospitalizations and the positivity rate that is currently at 14%, the highest in quite a while. If you are sick, do not go to work quarantine at home and get tested for COVID-19. Cabrera says the same goes if someone in your household is sick. If you have COVID-19, he says, isolate safely from your family. And if you're infected and can't isolate safely at home, go to a government quarantine facility. Meanwhile, Dr. Anit David was asked to help analyze some of the accumulated data since the infection started. It shows, among other things, that the highest infection rate was amongst Chukis and the highest death rates were amongst Filipinos. But to be clear, she says, it's not because of their ethnicity. There are social and environmental determinants that put some of our groups at higher risk than others. And that could be living in small, multi-generational households, medical costs, loss of health insurance, and lack of information. But the data is also allowing public health to hone in to COVID hotspots and be proactive instead of reactive. That's according to Public Health Director Art San Augustine. We're going out there where we're seeing the numbers, the concern, the uh, social challenges that any community or subgroup may have in our community uh, is what we're looking at too. Specifically, what they're looking at now are neighborhoods in northern Guam where about 50% of all cases are found. Despite this new hotspot targeting and the fact that positivity rates remain high even after weeks of the current PCOR-1 lockdown, the governor is still not convinced that she should lift more restrictions. Mobility is also a factor, I think, in the spread. And if we can decrease mobility, then um, we are decreasing the risk of exposure and transmission. And so I think the much uh, better focus and the much better uh, intervention is to go in there and uh, identify uh, those that are susceptible, uh, test them and uh, provide uh, isolation and then also education. But at the end of the day, the governor adds, the way we stop the spread will ultimately rest on one thing, individual responsibility. Meanwhile, Public Health's rapid engagement team came back with some revealing results today. It found 29 positive cases out of 78 tested from a house-to-house -house testing deployment at the Zero Down Housing in Jigo. During today's press conference, Public Health Director Art San Augustine reported that between the villages of Jigo and Dededo, there have been 1,504 positive cases, or about 45% of the total 3,341 recorded so far on island. Here's San Augustine with details. We have a pre and an advanced party, and then we have engagement teams. And then day two, which is today, which is our first advanced party, followed by the engagement team. They go house to house, and we are over the Gil Baza and the zero down locations. And there we are now reaching out to individual homes, offering education material, a care package, but also very significantly offering testing. And so that's what's going on today and will continue on until tomorrow. The teams are made up of nurses, interpreters, medical personnel, community leaders, and village mayor representatives. According to San Augustine, there are 12 advits on location. Also in today's, today's press briefing, the question of why now was asked more than once regarding the active case finding in high-risk populations with limited access to health care. The governor responds. Anything I think can be said about what if we did this earlier, how could it have turned out? You could say that for anything. Um, 
but the fact now is that we are doing it. And so right now with the rapid uh, engagement team and with all the support that is being given to go forward in this direction, um, we are very comfortable again and confident that we will start to see more of the cases uh, going down. Efforts continue tomorrow. In other news, three more Port Authority of Guam employees have tested positive for COVID-19, bringing the total there to 15. The port's contact tracing team identified 11 port employees as close contacts to the 12th COVID-19 case reported earlier this week. All will be tested tomorrow at Public Health Northern Clinic. Port GM Rory Respicio says three out of the 11 employees experienced COVID-19 symptoms as early as last Friday and have not been at work since the onset of their illness. And a total of five employees from the Micronesian Resource Center one-stop shop have tested positive for COVID-19. Manielu Executive Director Samantha Titano says all 10 staff members are currently in 14-day self-quarantine and she's been checking in on them daily. Every day they're kind of saying, you know, that they're starting to feel a little bit better. So, you know, uh, everybody's in, in good spirits and just kind of really focusing on their health right now. We reported on Tuesday that the center closed after the first initial positive case. Taishino says they continue to offer limited services by working remotely. One of the big things that we've been doing um, since it came out was pandemic unemployment assistance, the um, program. And so we've been assisting a lot of people with their weekly claims, and that's something that's easily done over the phone. Um, so that's one of the things that we're continuing to process um, with the team that is um, feeling good right now. She adds they continue to do contact tracing, and because in-person services were by appointment only, they are able to track it easier. Going through our logs, we actually only had eight clients who came in, um, but we had other clients who just kind of did curbside services. So um, we've been able to contact, I think, almost all of them. I think that we've there's a couple of people who came in to the office that we still haven't been able to get a hold of. Um, so that's also kind of the reason why we wanted to, you know, make sure that the, the public knows. In the meantime, their Harmon office remains closed pending sanitization, which will be completed once they are done getting quotes for the service. As for the latest numbers, out of 526 samples from uh, various labs, a total of 75 returned positive. This brings Guam's overall COVID case count to 3,341 infections since March. 955 cases are still active. More than 2,200 island residents have recovered, and there have been a total of 61 deaths. And the Guam Memorial Hospital saw five more COVID patients hospitalized for a total of 62. Administrator Lillian Posada says 11 patients are currently under the ICU level of care and four patients are on ventilator support. She says eight patients remain under observation at the skilled nursing facility in Barragata Heights. And Guam has a few extra soldiers to help Guam's battle against COVID. Lieutenant Governor Josh Tenorio says officials from the CDC flew in to help the government of Guam control COVID. We have, I think, five uh, additional officials from Center for Disease Control that are on Guam. They started yesterday. They're uh, digging deep, helping us uh, further refine and report on the data uh, of all of the positive cases. The lieutenant governor says GovGuam made the request to the CDC for help in several areas of COVID mitigation. We asked for them. We asked for additional uh, epidemiologists to help on the data side. We also asked for some of their experts uh, on the contact tracing side. Uh, they're in with our teams as we expand contact tracing and uh, push folks that have been trained uh, into, the, into the contact tracing and surveillance side. The CDC officials will be here for the next 26 days, and he's hopeful it will help with the responsiveness in attending to positive cases. And with thousands out of work and no idea when they'll be back, many have been relying on pandemic unemployment assistance to keep their shelves stocked with food and a roof over their head. But the Labor Department says fraudulent claims continue to be an issue, halting the release of the payments. Peter Santos has more. We ran a batch last Tuesday, and... Um... <coughs> Uh, it, it came back and it was riddled with fraud and we were trying to figure out how this uh, fraud got through. Department of Labor Director Dave De La Sola referring to the most recent cases of fraud that held up the latest batch of PUA payments. De La Sola says that PUA recipients can now be expecting monies to hit the banks soon. 
We managed to batch it and it came out to be uh, $13.9 million that is going to be going out to our community at the end of this week, beginning of next week. De La Sola broke down a spreadsheet highlighting the amount of fraud occurring in just one day of claims, adding that out of 454 claims, 89.88% are fraudulent. What I want you to see here is the red is, is fraud and the yellow and orange are claims that are were clean. You can see this is the amount of fraud versus clean well, claims for a typical day. Almost half of fraudulent claims filed have been cases of identity theft, according to Della Sola. Out of all the fraud, there's about 30 to 40 percent of that fraud are uh, identity theft. I can tell you we've had prominent politicians, lieutenant governors, uh, former AGs, personal friends, executives that we saw on this list that uh, we called up and they had no idea. De La Sola says his team is working six days a week to get the monies into the hands of the people. Reporting for Guam's News Network, I'm Peter Santos. Her words made waves after appearing on The Link Show Wednesday morning. Monica Broussard has garnered her the nickname the Quarantine Queen after her and her daughter have been subjected to now 29 days in quarantine. Tyler Matanani tells us more. It began with a medical procedure for her daughter in Hawaii. It was then that Monica Broussard and her daughter Maya began what would be their first round of quarantine in a government facility. Now back on Guam, Monica tells her story of being held involuntarily at the Dusatani. We landed here. It was around 8.30ish. Um, you're just coming in. And honestly, at that point, I felt like just the number on that flight. Um, they never asked us why we were returning, um, how, what your, what your health state, nothing. According to Monica, health officials were present at the airport, but they were only there to issue health clearances. There are people that look distraught. There are people that were barely walking. There are people in wheelchairs. But, I mean, you know, they'll tell you, go to this line, go to this line. After getting processed at the airport, passengers then had to wait a few more hours for bus transportation to the Dusatani, only to arrive to the quarantine site, which took hours again. By the time she and her daughter got to their room, it would be past midnight. All the while, Monica says she made it clear that her daughter just had surgery, she had the proper documentation for an emergency hardship, and they both have underlying health issues. The guardsmen and the reservists, I have to say they worked really hard. Um, they, I, I will tell you, they were set up for failure. There was no public health person on site at that time to answer any questions. If I had a question, all the guardsmen said were, I'm sorry, you'll have to refer that to a public health official. They're the only ones who can answer it. Monica says a public health official came later in the morning, but despite qualifying for an emergency hardship, she wants to give families that have more urging reasons for release the opportunity. But she's drawing attention to deeper issues, such as the exceptions that have been made to previous passengers. My last name ain't nothing. When we were getting down after immigration, there were people separating different ways. And I'm like, okay, is it because that person has special privileges? I thought that once you land, everybody goes on this mandatory quarantine. Regardless of who you are, it should be done. And Monica doesn't draw it there. She asked a question many of us have been wondering. Why is it that if someone tests positive, they have the option to isolate at home? But for those returning to bury their loved ones, say their final goodbyes, or are returning from off-island medical procedures, why are they not given the same treatment? I hope that the government officials are watching this right now and listening. The process is broke. You would think um, after almost seven months, something is figured out. But I challenge those high officials. I, I bet no one will call me within 30 days, you know, to ask me, hey, Let's work together. How can how can you help me help the government? Help, I'll help you if you want me to write down everything and then what I think, you know, how you can help other people. I guarantee you, I guarantee you no one will call me. Reporting for Guam's News Network, I'm Tyler Matsunani. 
We followed up with Monica today, who is still in quarantine at the Doucet. Yesterday, Speaker Tina Mooney Barnes, along with public health officials, met with her via Zoom to hear her story and took note of how they can improve the overall process. Monica says they were unaware of the issues and that they would come up with solutions and follow up with her on Friday. One of the immediate actions she was told would be that a public health official would be on site at all times. We're going to take a short break. Be back with more news. Don't go away. While we've all been through a lot over the years, typhoons, earthquakes, and now COVID-19, we've been able to get through these together. For more than 80 years, Cabo's Insurance has been protecting your homes, your businesses, and the health of your family. We are here today, and we'll be here tomorrow. There are better days ahead. Tomorrow's a new day filled with hope and choices. The possibilities of what we can achieve together are limitless. Let's continue to work together to ensure a brighter tomorrow for all of us. The Taipei Economic and Cultural Office in Guam is pleased to announce the grand opening on October 10 at Suite 727 Guam International Trade Center. The event marks the 109th National Day of the Republic of China, Taiwan, known as Double Ten Day. We are in the middle of the most serious health crisis of our lives, and it affects everything from jobs to schools to the way we live. In addition to worrying about recovery, we must now worry about health care. And we shouldn't have to make choices between food and medicine, going to the doctor, or buying gas. We all need access to health care. And now, more than ever, we need hospitals and clinics which can respond to pandemics. We must get the vaccines and new treatments for COVID-19. We must be ready with ventilators and partnerships with the federal government for our emergency facilities and have pandemic plans which provide a secure safety net. We must be ready for the next crisis. And this takes a leader in Washington who is trustworthy and will work with local leaders and experts. This is why I am running for Congress. I humbly ask you for your vote. Si Zuus Ma'asi, Maraming Salamat Po. I'm Robert Underwood, and I approve this message. KUAM News, winner of the 2020 Regional Edward R. Murrow Award for Excellence in Social Media. Welcome back. Public schools are talking about it, and the private schools are fighting for it. The opportunity to return to face-to-face -face learning. But ultimately, it's the government's call, and Adloop says it's not the right time. KUAM's Adriana Cotero reports. You know, it's been 215 days or seven months since, you know, the last time uh, we were in face-to-face -face education. Harvest Christian Academy is continually advocating for having the choice to re-enter schools. Administrator Jeremy Zajacek. We believe that we can do it safely. Uh, we believe that we can we can do school safely. Just trying to respectfully, um, you know, make the plea for the opportunity for us to have a choice to open the school. And not, not that every school needs to open, um, but as schools are ready. Zadicek says they want to start these conversations early, having sent open letters and communicating with Adaloop their concerns. The reality is, you know, the compounding effect of just not having education like it like it should be done. I'm just really, I'm really nervous um, that the compounding, app, you know, impact of this is, is going to be not what we want. We're going to respect, you know, uh, the authority of the governor and the in Department of Health that are making these decisions. You know, we're, we're going to abide by their rules. We, we just feel like there hasn't been um, a voice. Meanwhile, Catholic School Superintendent Dr. Juan Flores says while they can't wait to return back in the classroom, majority of principals are not eager to open schools right now. The problem is that um, for many of our, our students, they have extended families and they are not staying home when they leave school. If we can't have cohort living, you know, meaning everybody's going to be just confined to the group that they're with, then we're increasing the chances of that transmission in school. Dr. Flores adds another issue is most schools do not have enough staff to run both online and in-classroom instruction. As we reported earlier this week, Guam Department of Education is restarting their planning committee for reopening and project January as a target date. And during today's press briefing, KUAM asked Adaloop where they stand on the matter. So I tell you that we're working with the goal of face-to-face, -face, uh, but based on these numbers and based on the uh, data that's been shared, it really is a, a, a risky 
uh, enterprise when we're dealing with a surge right now. Uh, and the last thing I just ask is, or I, to add is, um, all of this is to try and also make sure that parents will always have a choice. Lieutenant Governor Tenorio says announcements are forthcoming. Reporting for Guam's News Network, I'm Adriana Cotero. The Guam Election Commission is urging voters to exercise their right to vote and do it early. The GEC will hold early voting this Saturday from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. in Okudu High School. You don't need to be from the Dededo District to vote there. In keeping with social distancing protocols, voters are reminded to wear a mask and bring a black or blue pen. GEC Executive Director Maria Pangalinen reports that as of yesterday, a total of 6,052 voters have participated in the general election. They're also working with public health to assist voters in quarantine. As a reminder, voter registration ends next Friday, October 23rd. For more, informa for more information, contact the GEC at 477-9791. A 36-year-old man accused of immigration violations pleads not guilty during his arraignment hearing this morning in federal court. Carlos Enrique Morales is accused of committing visa fraud over the span of three years from September 2017 through August 2020. He was indicted on conspiracy to commit visa fraud and visa fraud charges. Two months ago, he allegedly presented a fraudulent U.S. permanent resident card to U.S. Customs and Border Protection agents during an outbound flight from Guam to Hawaii. Morales was released on personal recognizance. The court set trial for December 22nd. And before federal drug defendant Daryl J. Guerrero's case can head to trial, his new defense attorney, Jay Areola, still has to, deter to determine whether he can represent him or withdraw because of a conflict. Guerrero's case was heard this morning in Magistrate Judge Michael Bordalio's courtroom. He was indicted back in January for possession of 50 or more grams of meth with intent to distribute. Earlier this month, his attorney Curtis Vandeveld motioned for withdrawal, and the court granted the request. The court has since appointed Areola as defense counsel and set trial for November 5th. Members of the Senate Judiciary Committee asked Supreme Court nominee Amy Coney Barrett about voting rights, health care, and other topics on her second and last day of questioning. CBS News correspondent Skylar Henry has more from Capitol Hill. Judge Amy Coney Barrett tried again to assure senators she would make her own decisions if she's confirmed to the Supreme Court. I've already said, you know, and, and I hope that you aren't suggesting that I don't have my own mind or that I, I couldn't think independently. Barrett vowed to keep an open mind on major issues such as abortion and health care. Again, I want to okay. stress I have no animus to or agenda for the Affordable Care Act. Senator Kamala Harris, the Democratic vice presidential nominee, asked Barrett about a Supreme Court ruling that struck down part of the Voting Rights Act. Do you agree with Chief Justice Roberts, who said voting discrimination still exists? No one doubts that. I will not comment on what any justice said in opinion, whether an opinion is right or wrong. If Barrett is confirmed to fill the spot of the late Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, the Supreme Court would shift to a 6-3 to three conservative majority. November 10th is the absolute date they have to fill the vacancy if the president and those who support him and the, those who support the Republican platform are going to keep their promise to end the Affordable Care Act. That is the cloud, the orange cloud over your nomination. Republicans this celebrated the prospect of her confirmation. This is the first time in American history that we've nominated a woman who's unashamedly pro-life and uh, embraces her faith without apology, and she's going to the court. A committee vote on Barrett's nomination is scheduled for Thursday. Democrats are expected to request a hold, pushing that vote to next week. Skyler Henry, CBS News, Capitol Hill. Still more news ahead. Please stay with us. Your community calendar is brought to you by Taco Bell. Whether it's your first meal or your fourth meal, we've got you covered. Taco Bell, live moss.
Much of the corruption we see today is widespread in our government. And if we allow corruption to continue, we all lose. And just like they tried to tear me down for fighting corruption, the corrupt will do all they can to attack you and spread half-truths about you. But we can fight back. Let's put an end to corruption. Vote Joanne Brown for Senator. My name is Joanne Brown and I approve this message. Paid for by the committee to elect Joanne Brown for Senator. 100% truck, 100% Jeep brand. The all-new Jeep Gladiator is the most capable off-road mid-size pickup truck crafted for adventure. Equipped with best-in-class towing capacity, legendary Jeep brand 4x4 capability, and backed by Guam's only lifetime powertrain warranty. Drive home in a brand new Jeep Gladiator today, starting as low as $283 per paycheck during Jeep Adventure Days. Call us at 477-7807 or visit our website at carsplusguam.com to get pre-approved today. Our new McDonald's Spicy Chicken McNuggets are just the right amount of spicy. A small to medium Sprite kind of spicy. Uh, let's get a McFlurry after this kind of spicy. But if you get the mighty hot sauce, it's a napkins up for foreheads now kind of spicy. Uh, this came from McDonald's kind of spicy? Because our Spicy Chicken McNuggets, breaded in tempura and made with cayenne, are just the right amount of spicy. Unless you remember what I said about the sauce. ba da ba ba, -ba. Hafidi Guam, this is Telu Tidy Wee. Fighting for you has been my honor, regardless of the politics and the challenges we faced. I've worked hard every day to improve GMH facilities, fund security cameras for public safety, support road repairs, and call out legislation and decisions that break the people's trust in government. The fight for these priorities isn't over. It's just begun. I'm Telu Tidy Wee. I approve this message and humbly ask for your vote. Thank you, Guam. We are in the middle of the most serious health crisis of our lives, and it affects everything from jobs to schools to the way we live. In addition to worrying about recovery, we must now worry about health care. And we shouldn't have to make choices between food and medicine, going to the doctor, or buying gas. We all need access to health care, and now more than ever, we need hospitals and clinics which can respond to pandemics. We must get the vaccines and new treatments for COVID-19. We must be ready with ventilators and partnerships with the federal government for our emergency facilities and have pandemic plans which provide a secure safety net. We must be ready for the next crisis. And this takes a leader in Washington who is trustworthy and will work with local leaders and experts. This is why I am running for Congress. I humbly ask you for your vote. Sidzuus ma'asi, maraming salamat po. I'm Robert Underwood, and I approve this message. Welcome back. For this week's Network of Nurses, we speak with Margarita Gay, who is the Community Health Nursing Administrator for the Department of Public Health and Social Services. Yeah, we're out there, you know, not only the streets, but in the community. How have uh, the nurses prepared uh, for uh, today's uh, house to house? Because uh, you guys really seem to be going into to ground zero. Yeah, uh, I'm not. You know, let, yesterday they assessed the area, how many houses, how many people were going to to uh, be testing or uh, interviewing, and so today I, we will be going. And as, as soon as I'm done here, I'm going straight down there to meet with the team of nurses and some of our contact tracers and logistics and, um, um, you know, the other public health uh, people to go out to these houses and we're going to uh, assess them and then test them mm -hmm. uh, down at the at the at this community area. I know you, you, you have all this experience um, going out mm -hmm. and doing outreach, but this one is, is really different um, because of uh, the risk. Um, how overwhelming has it been for you, I guess, this particular response and, and your uh, team of nurses? Oh, um, how many months already? Six months, seven, almost seven. Uh, it's, we are, we are um, taking a toll, but we're still going because, you know, without the help of the other nurses from DOE and the other uh, newly hired RNs, LPNs, CNAs, we are able to continue our, our job. Um, but it is taxing, uh, and especially when you go out to the at-risk communities, you know, like we went to the prison 
we went out to the homeless shelters. We went out to um, all these different um, at-risk um, areas. And you not only do the job, but you even have that sense of we fail for them because they they lack some of the resources. And and during this time, we're unemployment, and so we're seeing we're seeing a lot. And and it's we want to do more as as public health nurses, which we usually will help them a lot more. But because our response is focused, and so we we will get back to them. That's what I say. We're mm -hmm. we're not done. We're going to get back to giving them shots or checking on their prenatal, you know, because there's there's kids everywhere, families everywhere that need our help. And, you know, as nurses, especially um, our public health nurses, we don't stop. We just keep going and, and we just we just get on, you know, do our work and 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 continue the mission. Mm -hmm. um, but it is hard on us both um, physically because I'm not the youngest one there, yeah. but um emotionally and and that's why we really need i really need as a administrator and a supervisor i really need to motivate my nurses to let's go let's continue our our our, our job you know it's not every day we every day is a different story we go we go different areas do mm -hmm. different things but um you know it is hard on us because we're we're nurses, we're also moms, mm -hmm. and we have to take care of both ourselves and our families and our patients. Birthday shout outs are next. Don't go away. When I need to pay my Docomo Pacific bills or manage my account, all I do is visit mydocomopacific.com. It's easy to set up. I just visit the website and click on the link to set up my account. I filled up the registration page starting with my account number. I received a text message with a temporary username and password. After making initial changes on my security settings, I'm in! Now I can make payments or manage my Docomo Pacific account without needing to leave home. With Docomo Pacific, we're better together. Day. the nomination period of the 33rd Guam Youth Congress is now open, and elections will be held on October 19, 2020. Membership to the Guam Youth Congress is open to young people from all villages, middle schools, and high schools, the Guam Community College, and the University of Guam. I've been fortunate to work with colleagues in the Guam Youth Congress who are committed to representing the voice of young people in our community. And together we were able to push for change that will prevent diseases in young people, protect the environment that we will inherit, provide help to those suffering in the shadows. If you're between the ages of 14 to 24 and interested in representing your school or village and want to take part in the voting process, please contact my office at 989-2572 or reach out to your village mayor or school administrator. Change starts with us. It starts with you. It starts with you. And we need your voice in the Guam Youth Congress. And before we close out the news tonight, our latest round of birthday shout outs from the Cold Stone Creamery Birthday Club. Happy birthday to Diane Bobek. Happy birthday, Diane, from your GWSH Gecko family. May every day bring you something new and exciting. Wishing this birthday turns out to be amazing as you. Joanna Guzman. Happy birthday, Joanna, coming from husband, kids, and the family. They say we love you to the moon and back. James Corpus. Have a wonderful and safe happy birthday, Daddy. We love and miss you so much. Love your kids. Jimbo, John Paul, Haley, and Tin Tin. Samantha Jordan and Michelle Marie Quintanilla have ding a birthday. So happy birthday to the twins. Love the family. And that's uppercase love, all caps. Awesome. Josiah Longa, happy birthday, Josiah, from mom, mommy, Uncle David, Keanu, Ariella, and Jalen. And Maggie, happy birthday to you from your Mick family. Gotta love that. Awesome. And happy birthday to one of our own here at KU and one of our family members, Larry Armamento, the money man our bean counter and Larry we're happy to have you as part of our team especially during these trying times and we hope you and everybody has a happy birthday and you can be a part of the Cold Stone Creamery birthday